And now Iran, um, always high on the list of U.S. security concerns, an aspiring nuclear power, the backer of terrorism, with the perpetual question, isolate Iran, squeeze it, or try to coax this radical nation into more moderate behavior. It's the choice that's at the heart of our final resolution. It is time to take a hard line on Iran. Derek Chalet, on that resolution, it's time to take a hard line on Iran. Do you declare yes or no? I'm a yes, but I am a yes but, and I'll explain. Um, Iran provides material and political support to those who are trying to destabilize the Middle East. Iran supports terrorists. Iran's forces have been responsible for the deaths of thousands in places like Syria. Iran's proxies have killed American civilians and our troops. Iran represses its people at home while impoverishing them to achieve its aims abroad, and Iran wants to develop nuclear weapons. So, of course, it's time to take a hard line against Iran. To me, the, the challenge is how best to do so. Uh, that begins by forging the strongest possible international consensus against Iran's behavior, not just among our partners in the Middle East, but in Europe, Russia, and increasingly in Asia. Iran must know that its actions have consequences, whether in the form of economic pressure, political isolation, or even military response. In other words, the best way to take a hard line is to present a united front. And that's what the Iran nuclear deal did. It was a smart, hard line policy in which the United States built leverage and brought the world together to bring unprecedented pressure on the Iranian regime to get concessions. The Iran nuclear deal did not solve all of our problems in, with Iran, but it did put the brakes on the most urgent and serious ones. So taking a hard line needs to be more than a slogan. It needs to be a means to an end. It's not just about talking tough and beating your chest. It's about pursuing smart policies that get you closer to your goals. Thank you, Derek Chalet. <laughs> the resolution, it's time to take a hard line on Iran. Stephen Cohen, on this resolution, do you declare yes or no? That's a no. You know, Derek, I, I mean, I, I kind of give him the credit that he's made a, at least a semi-persuasive case. I mean, I don't think it's off the charts like some of the things that have been said about Russia. I'll take it. I'll take it. No, I'll you should. It. You should. You should. But my feeling is, is that the United States, or Trump as we like to call the United States today, having left the nuclear agreement and reimposed sanctions, I ask myself, what would a harder line result in? And I think it would result in results that we wouldn't like, and that's why I think, no, these results. It's likely to create instability inside Iran because there's political conflict there. That is likely to spread to Iraq and Syria and elsewhere in the Middle East, and I don't see that as good for anybody. Secondly, it certainly would, at least theoretically, risk war, depending on how hard this hard line is. And that could involve the United States, Israel, and possibly Russia. Thirdly, given their financial profitable urges, it's probably going to continue to alienate our European allies, who are vested economically rather than ideologically in Iran. It will then increase, and you may think this is a good or bad thing, uh, Russia's military and energy producing role in the world because... Stephen Cohen, I'm sorry, and your time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Going now to Corey Shaki on the resolution, it's time to take a hard line on Iran. Please tell us how you declare. It is time to take a harder line on Iran. They are the top state sponsor of terrorism in the world. They are destabilizing neighboring governments. They are arming Hezbollah and Hamas. They are keeping Bashar al-Assad um, in power and doing a lot of the murderous work of that horrible war. Uh, and they are occasionally interdicting shipping in the Straits of Hormuz, through which an enormous amount of the world's oil transits. Uh, so, so yes, we should take a harder line uh, I agree with both Stephen and Derek that withdrawing from the Iranian nuclear agreement made that harder because it makes it harder for us to get the support of countries that we need to take a harder line. The basic problem in American policy for the last two administrations toward Iran has been that uh, both 
the Trump administration and the Obama administration had an unbelievable policy, namely either you stop your nuclear weapons program or we will destroy it. And I don't think that's credible out of either of the two governments. We need a wider range of tools uh, to manage the Iran problem. At, the, at its core, the Iran problem is that the domestic legitimacy and the foreign policy of Iran have the same root, which is they view that themselves as a revolutionary power. So taking a soft line on Iran doesn't result in Iran stopping doing these things. Thank you, Kari Shaki. <laughs> it's time to take a hard line on Iran. John Mearsheimer, do you declare yes or no? I say no. Uh, I take this resolution as a question uh, dealing with President Trump's decision in May of this year to withdraw from the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran. And uh, I think that that was a fundamental mistake. Look, the question is, if you have a country, if you have a country like Iran that is thinking about getting nuclear weapons, what's the best way to prevent that from happening? And there are basically two ways you can do it, or at least think about doing it. One is you can threaten that country, or two, you can try to cooperate with it as much as possible, work out some sort of rapprochement, and remove the incentive for that country to get nuclear weapons. The question you want to ask yourself is, why do countries want nuclear weapons? They want nuclear weapons because they understand they are the ultimate deterrent. And if you're threatened, you really want to have nuclear weapons. Why does Israel have nuclear weapons? Because its leaders think they live in a dangerous neighborhood where they want to have the ultimate deterrent in their back pocket. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So there's going to be a very powerful incentive for the Iranians to think the same way. Now, the hawks believe that you can get really tough with the Iranians and you can beat them into giving up nuclear weapons forever. I don't think that's going to happen. First of all, it's just going to reinforce the hardliners inside Iran. And second of all, nationalism is a very powerful force. And the idea that you can push the Iranians around, I think, is a misguided thought. Thank you, John Mearsheimer. It's time to take a hard line on Iran. Last in the lineup of panelists to declare yes or no. Mark Ruel, Mark, you're act. Are you a yes or no? Yes. Uh, I have to say, I mean, this is one of those issues uh, that I think the Trump administration has actually done the right thing. I have to commend it. It has stopped the surreal situation where the United States was uh, feeding tens of billions of dollars into the Islamic Republic, into its Shiite imperialism throughout the region for a short respite to the production of centrifuges. It makes no strategic or moral sense why we would want to give money to a regime that is gauged in mass slaughter in Syria, why a regime that has deployed a Shiite legion, the first time actually in modern history that we have an Islamic state that can deploy uh, not its nationals, but a foreign legion abroad into combat, why we would want to give money to a state that is building Hezbollahs throughout the uh, Shiite regions of the Middle East. I just think this is nuts, particularly since the JCPOA was such a very, very bad deal. It's as leaky, it's, it's got as many holes as Swiss cheese in it. The, I think the best thing that uh, one can say about that deal is that it allowed us to uh, pretend that we're not going to have a problem uh, down the road. We are going to have a problem down the road. I would also add the, uh, the demonstrations that have been going on in Iran since December ought to tell you they're not shouting out down with America, down with Donald Trump. They're shouting down with the regime, down with the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Thank you, Royal Mark Arecht. And that concludes opening statements with the resolution, it's time to take a hard line on Iran. And now our debaters will respond to one another directly, starting with some questions from me. So looking at the opening round, we have three yeses and two noes. I want to go to Corey Shockey with some points made by people on the no side, which, which, which seem to all come down to the question of dangerous unintended consequences of taking a harder line on Iran. On the one hand, Stephen Cohen saying you would risk war. Number one, is that true? Is the risk worth it? And John Mearsheimer say, saying that the kind of pressure that all of you who support the yes side are talking about is the very reason that an Iran covets nuclear weapons in the first place. Dangerous unintended consequences. What about that? Uh, 
yes, I think there are dangerous unintended consequences for confronting Iran's destabilizing and dangerous behavior, but there are also dangerous unintended consequences of not confronting it. Um, it's not, it's not a 90-10 decision that you're making. Allowing Iran to continue to destabilize regional governments, to interdict the free commerce through the Straits of Hormuz, to, uh, to be, continue to be a state sponsor of terror. Recall that the Iranian government tried to assassinate the Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C. So not confronting those things. At a bad restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> also, also has the potential to encourage and incentivize continued Iranian malign behavior. So uh, yes, there are potentially dangerous consequences of doing it. There are also dangerous consequences of not doing it. Derek Chalet. Well, look, this is the land of no good options, right? When I was at the Pentagon during the negotiations of the Iran nuclear deal, I had nothing to do with the negotiations. Uh, what the Pentagon's role in this was, what do we do when the negotiations or if the negotiations fail? And all we're left with is the military option. Now, we have options. The U.S. military has, has, has shown over the years that it can do all sorts of things, overthrow governments, put a lot of uh, firepower on particular targets. But those, those are not particularly palatable options. So when we look at the Iran nuclear program as a challenge, we have to think, all right, how do we try to solve this problem? We have a series of tools we could use. We have military tools, we have diplomatic tools, we have economic tools. How do we try to change their behavior? So I would argue we were in a better position where we had isolated the nuclear problem, Rell's right, temporarily, 10 to 15 years, so we could work on the other aspects of Iran's behavior that pose such a threat to the United States. The problem now that we pulled out of the, the nuclear deal, when you go to Europe, when you go out throughout the Middle East, what they're talking about is American policy, not Iran's policy. And I don't believe that Iran has actually benefited that much from the, uh, the nuclear deal. I mean, the Iranian people were on the streets, and they actually thought the nuclear deal was a bad deal for them. So the idea that now we're going to engage in some sort of negotiation to get a better deal from, from our perspective, a worse deal for Iran, to me is fantasy. John Mershaw. Yeah, I, I want to respond to uh, a point that Corey made and tie that into a point that rule made. You're critical of the Iranians for destabilizing regimes in the region. Is there any country that's destabilized more regimes than the United States of America? I mean, the hypocrisy here is really, with all due respect, stunning. We make a business of destabilizing regimes. And this brings us to the matter of Syria. I'm sorry, it was not the Russians and the Iranians who started that humanitarian disaster. It was in good part the United States, the Turks, the Qataris, and the Saudis who funded and trained the insurgents and tried to bring down Assad and failed and created a humanitarian disaster of the first order. The United States has blood all over its hands in Syria. And it was the Russians and the Iranians who came in later who are trying to put Assad back in power, and as distasteful as that outcome is, it's the only possible way we're going to stop the bloodshed in Syria. So, so John, John, I want to relate what you're saying to, uh, to, the, to the resolution more directly to take a question to a while. So are you, are you actually arguing that Iran, in a way, is, a, is showing wisdom and is a force for stability? In the region? It is in the case of Syria. Okay, let me take that to It's Ruel. the United States and its friends in the Middle East who caused the catastrophe. Ruel, that assessment of Iran's role in Syria. I, I, I don't want to get into the. I, John has made his point, but we're not debating right now, strictly speaking, the U.S. role. We are debating Iran. So, what about the role, the, the argument that Iran. You've made the case that Iran has been the destabilizing force in Syria. He says, no, actually, it's been a force trying to figure things out in the right direction. No, I mean, the destabilizing force in Syria was the Ba'athist uh, dictatorship of the Assad family. Uh, and the Syrians attempted in a moment to try to get rid of it. I mean, uh, people tend to now somehow scorn uh, the Arab Spring. I prefer to call it the Great Arab Revolt, but uh, you tend to forget that they were trying to overthrow just hideous regimes. Uh, and that hideous regime decided that the only way they could control the situation because they represented the Alawi, which are less than 10% of the population, was to start slaughtering the Sunnis. And of course, we stood by and watched it. 
Uh, and I don't think that was the high watermark of the Obama administration. So, and the Iranians are out there, they're out to recast the Middle East. And what they know, and a lot of people tend to forget, is that in the classical Middle East, that is from the Mediterranean to uh, Afghanistan, it's basically a 50-50 split between Shiites and Sunnis. And so the Iranians have learned that they can adopt a very aggressive sectarian approach and that they can get a lot of traction. Stephen Cohen, I don't have a direct question for you. I'd like you to respond to what you're hearing if you would like the opportunity, because it's rare that I haven't heard from you in a while. So go for it. <laughs> you haven't called on me in a while. Okay, go for um, it. I mean, there's a problem. Uh, not only Raul, but many Americans feel that they know which are hideous regimes and which aren't. And hideous regimes are ones we don't support. And the others are hideous. Uh, this thing of Syria, to me, has always been both a bafflement and, a, and involved a key question, because we have an empirical moment when a decision was made by President Obama. In 2015, President Putin of Russia said to Obama, we need to form an alliance in Syria against the Islamic State. And Obama was much inclined to do so, and in fact, my reading is he did agree and then he walked away from it. And Putin then intervened on his own, I think in September. But what Putin said to Obama, and you know, you could run down Putin all you want, but first you need to read him. He doesn't talk about the United States the way Khomeini does. You just haven't read Putin. You're just making that up. I mean, it seems right to you. It seems right to you, but it's not true. Here's the point. Here's the point. What Putin said to Obama, and Obama thought about it and decided against, is we have a choice, 2015. It's either going to be the Islamic State in Damascus, and remember the Islamic State then was whack, 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 or it's going to be Assad. There's no alternative. Give me an alternative. So either we keep Assad in Damascus, or we let the Islamic State take it. Obama let, decided let, to do let, nothing. Israel agreed with Putin. I, I want, I want to, there's been a tacit alliance Stephen, I, between Putin and Israel. I want to intervene because so I want to bring for yourself. I want to bring the topic back, the, the focus back to Iran at the moment, and well, go and no, I, I understand, but I want to bring another dimension that we haven't discussed yet, which is this notion that's been out there since the Islamic Republic came to be, that there's a there's a moderate element, there's a there's a there's a uh, there's a group there to go to, who right. want to be moderate, and we should be playing to them. Now, your positions on this, yes or no? I'll go to you first, Corey Shockey. How does that play? Would taking a hard line? It, do you believe there's a moderate element to play to, to engage with? Would taking a hard line work to enhance that, or would it I work to there are silence moderate it? Moderate Iranians. I do not believe there are any moderate Iranians in the government. Mm -hmm. Derek Chalet? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. I think that uh, the, the government, what counts for moderate in the Iranian government is not very moderate. So the, the current Iranian president only looks moderate when he, you compare him to the previous Iranian, Iranian president, Mani Najad. It's so sort taking, of like, so, so it's, taking a hard line plays how in that dimension? The, well, the yeah, I think there are, there are plenty of Iranian people, as we have seen as evidenced in the, the demonstrations over the last eight months, that have huge problems with that regime. Uh, so I think that uh, showing that the regime uh, w will suffer consequences for its behavior, I think can have an effect. Uh, John. John, I just want to make a very quick point that's yep. relevant to this question. I, I was in Iran in December, and uh, I talked to all sorts of leaders up and down the chain of command across the political spectrum. And almost everybody says that they're actually quite good strategic situation in the region now, but it's not because of purposeful behavior on their part, the kind of story you're hearing from the people who disagree with me up here. It's largely a result of the foolish policies of the United States. Just take Iraq, for example. You know they fought a war, uh, a long war, eight years in the 1980s with Iraq, and now they have tremendous influence in Iraq. Why? because the United States toppled Saddam Hussein and left Iraq wide open for them. They make the same so, argument with regard to Syria. Let, they let, are in the catbird seat in Syria, but it's not because of anything they did. It's because of the foolishness of the United States, which dropped this big apple So the US, lap. as you point out, pursued, pursued regime change in Iraq. Ruel, 
would you support re regime change as part of taking a hard line against Iran? Well, sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure the I'm not sure the, the administration's obviously not there, but I think uh, you definitely want to take an, a containment approach towards the Islamic Republic, and a contain, containment strategy is effectively a regime change strategy. I think you do want to ally the United States with the demonstrators in the streets. I think you do want to ally them to the massive eruption and the Green Movement of 2009, 2010. And I'll say this on the moderate issue. I mean, uh, you know, the problem is that the moderates in Iran keep getting stuffed. Uh, and there's one thing we know certainly is that Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran, is not a moderate. Uh, he is a founding father of the security state. He's a founding father of the intelligence ministry. And I must just say that some of the commentary that came out of the Obama administration about him was just historically absurd. It had no basis in primary material. Derek Sorry Schley. about that, Derek. Derek Slay, the regime change question as well for you. Does taking a hard line mean working deliberately towards regime change in Iran? It is hard to see how the United States is going to uh, have a Middle East that is congruent with our interests with the current regime in Iran. That doesn't mean that regime change equals military invasion right. uh, uh, like we saw in Iraq. Uh, but I think uh, US, pol U.S. presidents from both political parties have made this clear. Uh, even Donald Trump, I think, agrees with this, that it's, it's, it's hard to see how the United States can serve its interests with the, with the Islamic uh, regime in Iran. So what are the implications of that, Corey Shockey? Uh, well, it depends on whether you're actively going to do anything about it. To, to, I agree with Raul that aligning ourselves with people who peacefully protest for political change in their own countries uh, is almost always uh, where the United States ought to seek to be. But whether you take action to overthrow the Iranian government or whether you do something use our tools at hand to draw attention, to create friction between the government and their people. For example, by drawing attention to the fact that the Iranian government struck 10,000 names off the electoral rolls for parliament because these people had political views that uh, the Iranian government wouldn't support. To draw attention to the human rights violations, to the torture of uh, prisoners arrested in 2009. We can do those kinds of things and help force accountability on the Iranian government. But doing more than that, I, I worry, would be uh, would open us up to uh, a John Mearsheimer in future. <laughs> John Mearsheimer. Just two quick points. You know how ballistic we go when countries like Russia interfere in our domestic politics? Again, the hypocrisy here is just stunning. Talking about doing regime change here, there, and everywhere. Don't you folks believe in sovereignty? We believe in sovereignty when it comes to the United States. Why shouldn't we believe in sovereignty when it comes to other countries? The second point I would make is, when you look at our track record, Raul, on regime change, Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, it's one failure after another. Why are you confident that we can make regime change work in Iran and have a happy ending it's when not, we failed so many times? Well, well, one, I'd just say, one, it's not us that would be making it. It would be the Iranian people. We aren't doing anything that they don't want. What we can do is we can stop enriching the regime. We can and put the sanctions back up, which we are doing, and they were going to come back up in force, real force, come November. There's no sense on, uh, in fact, giving that regime further money so it can continue its aims abroad. I, I just find that absurd. And I will just say this. I don't want to get into a rock discussion here, though I'm quite willing at any time. I can give I you 10 seconds I to will do this. just make note this. You know, as, as bad and corrupt as it is, uh, you know, the Iraqi democracy still exists. It is still struggling, and guess what? Much of that democracy is not terribly cracked up about the imperial hand of Iran in its own country. And with, that, and, and that. with that mention of Iraq, we conclude discussion of our, discu of our resolution about Iran. It is time to take a hard line on Iran. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.